the power. We thank you for the reality of knowing that Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you for my brothers and sisters. Today, we're going to share. We're going to. Hello everyone, you are about to listen to the teaching of Pastor Raymond Burnett, pastor of Mana Worship Center. We hope that you will learn from the message you are about to hear and to realize that books will inform, but the Bible has the power to transform you. Now sit back and open your mind and heart for God to speak to you. In order for Peter to go there, God had to give him a vision first. <laughs> he had to convince him that this is what I want for you. I think in some sense, there's a little bit of me like Peter. Because being a pastor is never, ever what I wanted to be or to become. Far from it. I've seen a whole pile of it when I was growing up. Growing up in a preacher's home. Preachers coming into my home. All kind of stuff. I, no, you do that. I support you. But no, thank you. He had to bring me from St. Vincent to Toronto to show me that I'm, I should become. Had I been there still, I probably still would not have done it, knowing me. I might have been dead by now. That's just my angle on that. So Peter had to get the vision. And in the vision, he said to God, I have never eaten anything unclean. Because they get up and eat. But God, those are forbidden animals according to our law. We can't eat that. But he said, eat. God had to convince him with his religious upbringing. And many of us have a lot of religious upbringing. And they become hindrances for us. And then he said, he'd been talking to the other man whose name is Cornelius. And he said, by the way, get up. There's a guy down there. Somebody's coming to see you. He ended up going to Cornelius' house. Cornelius was not a, a Jew. He was a Gentile. He shared faith with him. Cornelius became a believer, and the culture was the owner of the house, when he makes the decision, everybody joins in the decision of the family for you and your house to be saved. Our Western world culture is when the man makes a decision, it is his decision, not the family's decision. You follow what I'm saying now? Can you imagine? If we went back to a place where the man made the decision and everybody followed, well, in some sense, it may be great. In another sense, it may not be. Because we all want our individual responsibility. So culturally, that was the place. So all of Cornelius' whole family, including all the servants that worked for him, became believers that day. Then they got baptized. And then, after they got baptized, they all began to speak in tongues. Wow, the Gentile got saved. Anyway, so Paul had this habit of eating with the Gentile folks. One day he discovered in the book of Acts that some of the Jewish brothers were coming down to visit. Peter was already having feast and fellowship. When they came in, he detached, he moved away. He, walked, he moved away from them. And Paul said, you are a big hypocrite, my brother. You were fellowship and eating before the rest of the Jewish people came down and you just want to prove that you're that holy and whatever else and you just segregate yourself like that. What's the matter with you? And they had a real serious breakdown, knockdown thing. I didn't say the fight. I did not say the swear. I'm simply saying they had disagreements. What is my point? Paul being as rigid as he was and wanted to find all the valid ways of living Peter wasn't as firm because he had a certain amount of bias still inside of him. He wasn't quite finished yet. You mean, you mean Peter had a lot of the rough edges still? Yeah. You mean Peter 
the man who denied Christ, yeah, he had some of that resurfaced in his life. There's some things that take a longer time to get out of you than other things. Would you remember that, please? I want to introduce that to you. I gave you a sheet a few weeks ago. I want to go back there. Some of you didn't bring it. Um, the sheet I brought looks something like this. I know, Marvin, you weren't here, so I'll give you a copy. Some of you weren't here. Martin, give me a hand here. You can share this one out. There are four copies there. And I think I have a few more someplace here to give you. And those people who are looking and following us, um, one day we're going to devise a, a website where we are going to put on our website all of the handouts that we give a church, that when you go on there, you can click on it, and you can see the same information. So that's what our plan is. All right, so everybody's going to get that. We're good. Now, if you need some more, I have some more. If you didn't get one, if you want to borrow one, all right, we good? All right, now that you got that. How am I going to get this to you? We're going to have a nice little piece of thing going on here, and I want to see how good you are. Are you ready? I showed you something like this, and I gave you a copy of it, this one. It's a little chart I made up so that everybody can follow something. And the reason why he wants me to finish this today with you is this. Remember I said to you earlier that he doesn't want us to become easily led astray if we don't study the word, because then you can be following people with certain teachings that are not biblical. If you don't understand the book you have, if you don't know your textbook, it is easy for people to tell you what your Bible means. Right? I had a conversation with one fellow who's presently a pastor, but before he became a pastor, before I became a pastor, we had this discussion, a uh, very lengthy discussion. And the concept was, he said, Ray, um, you, you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus if you want to be a Christian. I understand you got baptized years ago. So we had this not long discussion for over an hour plus. At that point, he was going out with my wife's sister, and I was dating my wife. So we ended up at the same house having this discussion this night. This is quite interesting. He accidentally didn't marry that person, marry married somebody else. But the point I am making, he's passing us in Toronto now. So every time we meet, we chat, we laugh, we interact with each other. We are brothers in Christ. I've been to that same church before they took it over. There was another group there. And this other lady that I know, she made her life, gave her life to Christ. She wanted to get baptized. She used to go to that Bible study. She believed she should be baptized twice. She wasn't baptized once because she wanted to be loyal. She called it to me. And she wants to be baptized a second time because of the other fellow that she knew for many years. So anyway, one day, she said, you got to come with me. I said, why? I need you to come with me. I'm getting baptized. I said, again? <laughs> she said, yeah. So all right, I'll come. So we walked. I went to the church. It was at, right at Western Road and Lawrence, right at the corner there, almost there. So I walked in. I met the pastor. We got shaking hands and everything else. And the baptism pool is very unique, very, very unique. I like the style of it. Every church service, if someone makes their commitment of their life to Christ, they'll baptize them the same moment. So you walk up these stairs. The two of us stood up up here. Here's a little thing there. There's water on the other side. So she came down, went in, got in the water. He held her hand like this. We both hold on the hand. And she went down. She said, I baptize you in the name of Jesus. And he brought her back up. That's all he did. That was different. In the name of Jesus. Brought her back up. And she went, changed, we shook hands, had a little discussion, and then I left. Why did I do that? Really, I did it because it was something she wanted. I'd known her for years. Many years. Do I believe if I got baptized in the name of Jesus, it's enough? Do I believe if I baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's enough? The difference is, 
What I say in the name of Jesus or in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what I am doing is really what the important thing is. I am being identified with Christ in baptism. That's all that's happening. So we're fighting over a name. What, what this name or that name, we're fighting over that. And churches are destroyed because of that one thing. In many groups, the different to other people, if you're not baptized in the name of Jesus. And they use two, two texts in the Old Testament. Today's not the day for me to show you what that text is, what is all about. But the point I'm making is they make an issue of that. So then they say, you're not saved until you're baptized in the name of Jesus. Well, others go just a little further than that. Here's your next step. And if you don't speak in tongues, you are not saved. So you mean to tell me all these thousands of people that serve God, give their life to Christ, and don't speak in tongues, they're not saved? No, they're not saved. Hold a second. Because in the book of Acts 2, you shall receive, the, and they go on and on. I say, okay, good, I hear you. I'm making a point. I'm driving this home as hard, the best way I know how. It is important for us to study your Bible. Know what it says and understand what it says. And especially in these last days, there'll be a lot of other false teachers and prophets that are present in our world now in our churches. It sounds great. It's not biblical. So, let me give you a base. I give you a sheet like this, and the first name I put on the sheet was Abraham. Abraham is in chapter 12 of Genesis. Well, look. Class, wonderful, terrific, excellent people like you are. Let's talk about what happened in the first 11 chapters then. We start with Abraham. Well, before Abraham came in Genesis chapter 12, well, what happened? I didn't write it down on your paper. That was going to be our discussion today. So in Genesis 1 and 2, we all know what happened, right? What happened? Come on, class. Talk back to me. Don't go in the Bible now. Don't go there now. Don't go there. Don't look there. I want to see how much you know. In Genesis chapter 1 or 2, Aileen, you've gone to your Bible. Oh. Eh? Creation. Okay, one, that's two, check mark. Creation, heaven and earth and everything else, 1 and 2. And God then, chapter 1 and 2, it also mentioned that God was talking about making man and everything else after his image. And then he did do that. He had this thought, he had this idea, had the discussion among themselves. The Father, Son, and Spirit had a fantastic discussion. We are going to make man to look just like us. No, he said to be like us in our image. He didn't say look, he said be like us. Remember this, not to look like, to be like. Two different things. You can look like somebody, doesn't mean that you are, like, you are the person too. To be like us, meaning being in our image, in our likeness. You're going to have a spirit man, you're going to have a soul man, you're going to have a body, just like we forgot. You got it now? Hello? Yeah. Be like us, according to our image. In our likeness, be like us. So when Jesus said, you're going to become fishes of men, you're going to become just like I am, Jesus said to the disciples. Whatever I did, you do. We are also with the same responsibility. So, Genesis 1-2. In chapter 3, what happened? Make notes on this one, because if I give you a quiz next Sunday, you're supposed to pass everybody 100%. Well, 95%. All right, what happened in chapter 3? You need to know what happened in chapter 3, Genesis. You better know. Then I'm going to start crying. What happened in chapter 3? No, you can't read it now. What happened in chapter 3? Talk to me, somebody. Eh? The genealogy? No, not yet. The who? What deception was it? Satan deceived them? Deceived them? You mean, oh, you mean the fall? Ah, we good. Deception, same thing, fall. It was the fall of man. Genesis chapter 3. Really means fall of man. Yes. That's when Satan came down one day, decided to come like a serpent, and had this conversation with Eve. And told her how wonderful it is for her to eat of this fruit. He told her, you know, you will be just like God. You'll be smart like God. You'll be brilliant just like, hey, he's selling the same kind 
kind of stuff, stuff with the wrong information. God said, I'm going to make you to become like I am. Like I am. To become. And we say, you are going to become like God. One second now. You mean I'm going to become like God? All you got to do is eat of that fruit from that tree, of, tree that is planted there that you're not supposed to eat from and you will be like God. That's what the Bible said. You shall be as God. I think you better see it in your Bible. Go in your Bible then because I think you need to see this. Genesis chapter 3. Are you there? Yeah. All right. You will be as gods. Genesis chapter 3. All right. So now the serpent was, verse 1, more subtle and so forth, um, which the Lord God has made. Um, verse 2, and the woman said to him, we, we, uh, we may eat of the fruit tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, Neither you touch it, lest you die. Listen to Satan now. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. Look at the next verse. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as... The King James said, God's. The literal translation said, God. In order we shall be little gods of this big God. And we shall be as God, knowing good from and evil. Wait, 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 wait. You mean you should think this through. So you mean I'm going to be as gods? I'm going to be able to run my own life, manage my own thing? I can make the kind of major decisions that God seems to be making with himself? You shall be as gods. Do you know our world is based on people becoming their own gods unto themselves? And he went on. And the woman ate of the fruit, and that was the problem. Well, the judgment came in that same text. Judgment came. He separated man, I mean, the, the animals. He put the serpent, say, you're going to be on your belly. He cursed that out. Remember we talked about curse? He cursed the, animal, the serpent. And he said to the man, the ground is going to be cursed because of what is going on here. He said to Eve, you're going to have pain in childbearing. That was part of the activity. He didn't curse the man. He didn't curse the woman. He cursed the ground, and he cursed the serpent. Those are the only two times that God used the word curse in that context. Follow me? Chapter 4. Then there's another fellow came up. Adam and Eve, it's time to have babies now. Baby time. We don't know how old they were. We don't know how long they've been together in the garden. We do not know that. But, and Adam knew his wife Eve. And she conceived and gave birth to a son and called him what? Cain? Is that what we call him? You sure? All right. And she conceived again and gave birth to another son. What's his name? Do you think she had baby girls too? There's nothing said in the text, but yes, they had boys and girls too. They had girls too. We don't know exactly how many children Adam and Eve had. We only know of three that were named. But they had many children. Follow me now. All right. And we all know that Adam and Eve had, this, uh, had these two children there. And it's time for worship. And they must have been taught, this is how you do worship to God. So the younger boy decided he's going to kill an animal. And he was going to offer the sacrifice to God. Praise God. God accepted it. His brother, who was this fellow, take care of the fruits and everything else, decided, I'm going to bring my fruit basket, and I'm going to give it to God. God did not accept that. Well, God will not accept it, not because he was upset with Cain, but because they would have known, both of them, would have known what was expected of God. Did you hear that? God rejected it. Cain didn't like the idea that his younger brother, in his mind, embarrassed him. He couldn't handle God rejecting his gift. Because in his mind, you reject my gift, you reject me. Huh, does that sound familiar? Do you think we as human beings do the same thing? So somebody give you a gift. You give him back. I don't want it anymore, man. Take back your, your gift. And then you think to yourself, so you rejected me too? Because oftentimes we think 
that the rejection of a gift or of something given to us is the rejection of the person. May I just say this nicely to you? Try your very best to se separate your gift from yourself. Why? Two reasons. Because if you don't know how to do that, you start internalizing and you feel a sense of rejection and you don't want to do it. Second thing is, you are more valuable than a gift. You are more important than a gift. So because I say, no, I'm sorry, I don't eat that kind of bread, I have not rejected you because I don't eat your bread. Many people don't know how to handle of the rejection of something because it's the rejection of the person that take it that way. Cain had that first experience. He thought God was rejecting him by the rejection of his gift. Are you still with me? Mm -hmm. Was that good enough? No. So Cain decided, you will never do this to me again. Sounds familiar? Human beings, eh? Even from the beginning. So Cain planned, I'm going to get rid of this brother of mine. Well, who put that thought in his mind? He'd never seen anybody killing anybody before. So in the heart of man, I want to explain this concept with you. If I don't finish anything else, I need to get this in. When man sinned, I want to hear this out. When man sinned and the sinful nature became a part of human beings, every possible sin that any human being can possibly commit is deposited within the sinful nature of the man. Any need, any sin you can think about. Every human being has the potential to be the worst in any form of sin. Every human being. Because the seed is there. All you need is something to water that seed. You just need, do you know that any person has the ability to be a murderer? All of us. Everybody can become one. Everybody can be a thief. It's a choice. In the heart of that cute little baby girl that was just born, in the being of that nice, handsome little boy, he's got inherent in him, in the sinful nature, every human sin resident in the form of a seed. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages outside, the payment of sin is death. Every human being has that. So there go I, but the grace of God is a very important statement. There go I, that murderer, if it wasn't the grace of God. And when you and I get upset and angry, all you have to take is one big baseball bat and hit somebody without even thinking, and you end up in jail. That baseball bat helped you to get there. So let's be not so quick to condemn people. Because we're ready to always send them to jail before they get a chance. Are, are you understanding that? And I think sometimes we forget that inherent in all of us is every possible sin that can be happened or acted on is resident within every human being. It doesn't matter how handsome you look, how gorgeous you are, how sweet you smell. The great, the most powerful cologne you can buy in the world. Smelling good is good, but the heart of man is desperately wicked, the Bible said. Isn't that what it said? Yeah. Desperately wicked. Yeah. Only God knows it. Praise God for his grace. Yeah. Amen. Therefore, every human being now has also the opportunity to be taught, A, how to handle it, how to control it, what kind of do? What then do? What do I do to make good choices? We all fed that. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I will not sin against you. So the word said, avoid or shun the very appearance of evil. But we see it. We appear, but we said, let me see how much more I can see. Because we are born with this inquisitive, curious part of all of us. So every person who come to our church, come into this room, as of today, that person's potentially the greatest person you'll ever meet on planet Earth. Or maybe somebody who's had the greatest painful experiences that they've ever had. And they're going to be coming to us 
to see whether or not there's a little bit of healing available for them. We got to love them into the kingdom of God, just like somebody loved us into the kingdom of God. Amen. Sometimes it's easy to condemn. It's easy to condemn. The easiest thing is to pass a word of judgment on people. But you don't know the whole story. You don't. Hey. Amen. I think you got that. I think you got that one. So Genesis 4 and 5, and in, in 5 it gives you a little bit of a history of different people like Seth, and Seth. we all know Adam and Eve had a third boy named Seth, and um, we all know what happened with that, and he became a man of God. In fact, in fact, if you look at this text, you're going to love this, Genesis 5, you're going to like this piece, I'm going to insert this one for you for what it's worth, Genesis 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made him, verse Two, male and female. Woo, finally lady showed up, right? <laughs> male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. It means man. In the day when they were created. And Adam lived, a, listen to this, 130 years. We finally find out all his brothers now. <laughs> and begat son, his son in his own image, likeness after his own image, and call his name. Wow. One second now. One second. One second now. Is that confusing? Not really. God created man in his own image and likeness. He had a son, and then he, the Bible never said he said he had son Cain in his own image and likeness. It doesn't mean he didn't. But there's something about the Bible that's forcing us to begin to think of uh, being in the image and in the likeness of God that we should never forget. And if you've lost it, he said, I want you to try and get it back. When Christ came, he said, I'm going to give you a chance to get back into that place where we now are conformed to the image of his son. Isn't that what the Bible said, Romans 10, Romans 12? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal, that you will prove what is that good and acceptable and Perfect will of God. That's for us to become like him. But then it says that Seth was in the image of Adam. There is something that was now being communicated to Seth that God wants us to pay attention to. He didn't say it wasn't in Adam, in, in Cain or Abel, you know. He just wants us to remember that this man, Seth, is somebody to pay attention to. Because everything that comes through Seth thereafter is moving towards one place that comes straight towards Christ. Did you hear that? Jesus Christ became a descendant of Seth, not of Cain, because Abel was already dead. Are you hearing? Are you, you got it? Clement, you got that? Okay, when you say you got it, that means you really got the wholesale part of this one. There's another piece to this. When you sit there, you think about how the Bible is so fantastic. I thought image. Image. The image of God. The image of Seth. We are in this image place with God ourselves. What does it look like? What is it supposed to look like? What are we supposed to look like? Should we not have some concept of when people see us, there should be something of Christ in us that they recognize? Should they not be able to say, like, like okay, Evan, you have a son. A son, how much of a resemblance he has of you? So we look for that. But how much of the resemblance of the mother he has? Somebody has a strong part of this whole story. All right? So I've got a son, my other son. Every time he stands up, he stands a certain way. He says, look how he's standing just like his father. He puts his head just like his father. There's some things we copy after our parents. When you and I are being talked about as being Christians, it should not be because we call ourselves that. It should be because people recognize that there's some Christ-likeness about us, and therefore they say, that one looks like a Christian because there's something Christ-like 
about him. Here's my question again, million dollar question. How much of Christ do, does people see in us? How much of Christ do they see? When we are upset, how much of Christ do they see? When we get annoyed, how much of Christ do they see? When we get accused falsely, how much of Christ do we see or demonstrate? When somebody rubs you the wrong way and you, piece your, you want to give them a piece of your mind, which piece do you have, share, you have coming out of your mind that maybe you should have held back and only saved that for another time? Sometimes the piece that comes out doesn't reflect the Christ who lives inside of us. So we have said. Then in chapter 6, in chapter 7, chapter 8, we talk about the flood. The, the flood came. So you're following the Bible now? So Genesis 1 and 2, we deal with what? Creation. 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 Chapter 3, we deal with the fall. Deception fall. We deal with the fall. Chapter 4 deals with what? Do, you're not looking. Don't look at the notes. Look up here. Shall we? Look up here. Chapter 4 deals with what? Cain gave them, so the both of the children. All right, Adam and Eve having their first set of children and the first murder being committed in the Bible by a brother. You notice that? A brother killed another brother, first murder. It wasn't a stranger, it was his brother. First murder. And then there's a replacement in chapter 5. Right? Seth came in. Ah, praise God. Seth came in and men began to multiply all over the place after that. Adam and Eve Doing well, because they had other children too. We just read that. Chapter 6 and 7 and 8, keep on going with that. It is a lot with the flood. Man became very vicious and wicked all over the place. They multiplied multi from the two boys and the sisters. Now, some of you are wondering, where did King get his, sister, his wife? Well, it had to be a sister. It had to be his sister, Cain's sister. It would have been his wife. I know people don't like to think that. But, but in those days, they, the, the, the composition genetically of mankind had not become watered down as it is right now, I'm calling it that. But there wasn't this kind of mutation issue that would have created some problems. So there were pure people being created in the image of God. God didn't create another set of people on the other side to go marry to Cain. It's obvious for you to think, and I to think, that yes, it was his sister. People don't like thinking that the Bible has those kind of things in it. Eh? What, there, was it there's a, there was no other evidence of what happened. So the whole pile of people got created. And then I want you to pay attention to the name of a man, and his name is Enoch. He was translated. The Bible talks about Enoch being translated. Remember him? Chapter 6. Chapter 6 talks about the daughters of men having something with the... The, the, the daughters of... Chapter 6 talks about... Um, the sons of God having, and the daughters of men cohabiting. Now, I am not going to tell you about the daughters of, sons of God and daughters of men, but there are a lot of teachings about who were the sons of God and who were the daughters of men. In one little sentence, here is the thinking. There are three different thoughts. Three different thoughts about this. One people believe, some people believe that the sons of God refer to angels. Another set of people believe the sons of God refer to very righteous people. And the third category, that the sons of God refer to people who are in um, leadership or kingly line. Those who are kingly line, married to the common people. My personal belief is, my personal belief is that the sons of God and the daughters of men, the sons of God were angels. And I go to Peter, and it helps me to understand that they're angels that messed up big time, not with Satan. That's with Satan. There's a judgment that's pending for them. But today, I will not elaborate on that much, but I believe that's my concept on that. And it's produced people. If you read the text, it will tell you what their offsprings look like. Giants in the land. It produced a category of people who didn't happen any other way but by some cohabitation. That is something that you're not going to go to heaven or hell if you don't get that right. You hear me you now? If you don't interpret that piece right, you're not going to heaven or hell because of that. So I just thought I'd insert that there. Amen. I hope you're learning something. All right. So you go on. And then there's Noah in chapter 7, the course of the flood, the events of the flood, and everything else. But if you were to keep, go through, keep reading the whole story, 
you'll also discover that the flood came in this way. This man named Enoch was a man who was upright before God. He was so upright, the Bible said, that God took him, disappeared. He's taken up, taken away. Enoch walked with God, and the Bible said, and he was not, and the Lord took him. Wow. Righteous man that God just take away from the earth? Yes. First one. He had a son named Lamech. Lamech had another son named Noah. But this fellow, there was a whole discussion about a son of somebody else named Methuselah. He lived for 969 years. It is believed that when this man, this godly man, and they had this conversation, they were naming this boy Methuselah. And it seemed to have been a very prophetic statement of naming him that way. Because his meaning means something like javelin in the first place. Another part of his meaning is, when he is dead, it shall come. When he is dead, it shall come. Prophetic statement. That's what Methuselah means. What is that? When he is dead, what shall come? It is believed in the same year Methuselah died, the flood came. So as, see how graceful God is? For as long as Methuselah had been alive, every time they said, Methuselah, bring me the water, it's reminding everybody in the family, when that boy is dead, something is going to come. So 100 years later, Methuselah, are you ready to get married? When he is dead, something will come. Well, he had children. He grew up. 900 years came, 920, 930, 940, 950, 960, 969, the man died. Shortly thereafter, the flood came. God is always giving people messages and indicating to us, this is how I am working my plan. I just want you to pay attention to it. I name people to reflect what I have in my mind. I name places to reflect what I want to do with it. Salem, for example, is a short form for Jerusalem. I understand this. So, so when, when Old Testament mentioned things, it wasn't accidental. It was strategic with God. God strategically planned things. So every time names are given, they reflect something. And I, I've all said this to you before. Think about reading the story of Jacob and his brother Esau, and even Isaac, and all the children that they had, and Jacob's children, and the name, the way they named them, and the way the mother named them. No, he, was lo he will love me. One of the meanings of their children's name. No, he will love me. Who do you think she's talking about? No, my husband, my, my husband will love me. Well, that's Leah's child. Leah wanted to be loved by this man, Jacob. But he loved Rachel, her sister. So she thought by giving him six children, I got a boy child for you, mommy. But he loved Rachel. So the boys were named to reflect what the conditions of their hearts were, many of them, and what messages they were sending. Let me ask you, when you got your name, do you know what your mother and your father were thinking about? So what every time we call your name ever since, it's reinforcing what your name's supposed to mean. What does Elvin mean? I wonder what your name means. Biblically, if you're going to name a child, try and find a child. Say, God, what name would you have me name? The seed that you have placed in my womb. I think that's important to name children because they live with the character of the name. Every name has character. So the flood came. And then in chapter 10, we had the, the descendants of Japheth and Ham. You know, after the flood, we had these three boys. Remember the three boys that came out of the flood? And their wives? Remember the flood came? Eight of them got saved. Noah, his wife, three sons and their daughters. Yeah. God is starting over. Listen to this part. All of creation was destroyed. Let me put it this way from human's point of view. 
Only eight people left. All of them. Eight of them left. Noah, his wife. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem's wife, Ham's wife, Japheth's wife. So everybody that now presently lives on this earth came from these three boys. Because Noah, them, as far as I know, didn't have any more babies. So you and I related to him, Sham, and Japheth. And if we believe we are descendants of Ham, then we all seem to have a lot of things in common with Mr. Ham. Do the little history of Ham and his descendants. We all know Ham is the one that we read about. And Canaan was cursed because of something that Ham did. And I told you about a book I read, and I told you the name of the book where the guy was making an argument that the, the sin of that person that we call a sin that Ham did was that he was shocked at the shade of his father, and he makes an exclamation about, and the father said, you should not have done this. He cursed the grandson. Canaan got cursed. A servant of servants shall you be. The fellow who wrote the book said, it means you'll be an excellent servant, but that you will serve your brothers. The same book says, all three boys, three persons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, all of them contribute three different aspects to human, human, humanity. Shem, the descendants of Shem became, we call them Jewish people. They're responsible for the law. Japheth, they have to do with the European kind of group of people. Where we talk about the mind, psychology, thinking, mind, philosophy, Greeks, philosophy, come out of this branch. Geographically, it's there. The centers of Ham, technology. The brown, yellow, black people, technology. Every one of them offer contribution to the humanity, generally speaking. So all of us have something to add to one another in the comp composition of the three boys. Do you understand that? Find your place, service driven, and be the best you can. Amen. Find your place. Serve humanity. Be the best you can. Music came out of Ham. Music came out of Ham. The descendants of Ham. It all came out of the African part of the world. Big thing happened there. Technology came out of there too. Let's be proud of that. We're not just a nobody on the earth. They may want to treat you like, but we're better than that just being nobodies. We've never been nobodies. None of the descendants of, 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 um, of Noah and his, fa his wife are nobodies on the earth. Everybody has a place to, to, to occupy and a purpose for being there. So let's recognize their strengths, learn from them, and let's help other people do the same. Are you with me? Okay, I'm about to stop talking now. Then you have a man named Nimrod and the Tor of Babel. Remember that? He wanted to see how great a person he is. He decided we're going to, that's a descendant of Ham right there. Um, they decided we're going to make a tower. We're going to build this thing straight up to God. We're going to have a worship service in this place, everything else. But his motive wasn't work. They wanted to serve, they wanted to be their own gods and serve God of their own. Out of that, whole troubled experience. Mankind experienced one of the worst things you could ever experience on planet Earth. The destruction of one language into different languages in this world. God didn't just create them because he had nothing else to do. Because had they continued to do that, they would have become the most powerful people on this Earth who got rid of God. We show you a way of how to get rid of God God said, anything these people put their minds to, nothing shall be possible for them. Nothing. I like when God said it about a person, you know. If God ever comes down to us one Sunday morning and said, this is the saints of God, you guys here. Anything you guys agree on, put them together, that I'm involved in, I want you to know that nothing is going to stop it from happening. Do I believe that? Absolutely. If we together, God, this is where you're leading us. This is what you want us to do. 
We are committed to doing this. And if this is what God wants, nothing shall stop it. Absolutely nothing. Because two or three shall agree as touching anything. It shall be done. Consider it. Consider it. Consider it. You guys are wonderful people. And after that came, God said, it's time for me to put my plan. I want to talk about Abraham now. See how far along it took us to get to Abraham? And I just give you an overview. Any questions? If it's not clear, let me help it make it clear. We good? I'm going to leave a copy of a handout for you. I want you to read this one. It's called about the donkey. Anytime you feel like people are trampling on you and you are not making it through life, read the donkey. Read this donkey. Many years ago, somebody gave it to me. 2010. 2010, somebody gave it to me. Nine years ago. I don't throw things away. I put a file. And occasionally, I pull it out and I read it. I say, wow. And then somebody gave it Thank you for taking the time to listen to our message presentation by Pastor Raymond Burnett. If what you have heard has been helpful to you, please tune in again or write us and let us know how this message has ministered to you. Our email address is pastor at mwctoronto.org or call us at 647-340-9252. We would love to hear from you. If you would like to support this teaching ministry, you can send a donation to our mailing address, 170 Oakwood Avenue, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, M6E-2T9. Thank you for listening.